very excited to have you with us. And uh, this is going to be a great presentation to have, help you, you know, take this organization to the next level. We hope that it's useful, that it's engaging. Our students have been working very quickly, I should say, given the short amount of time that they've been able to work on this project, but intensely. And we're very excited to be able to share the results of the findings of the class and the research that we've done. And I know that they had a wonderful experience in the live concert. So we're very excited, and we hope that this is useful for you and for the members of the board. So thank you for coming, and just like to welcome you. Thank you. Um, thank you for doing, letting me see this project with Dallas Tree Society. It has been actually really, really interesting to uh, you know, observe and actually learn a whole lot of things in the process. Um, so the November 19th concert, when we were to attend, and thank you again for the comp tickets, <laughs> we saw an audience that was engaged and had formed a community. It was incredible seeing all of these, uh, all the audience members uh, just go between groups and the social ecosystem that is formed. And we found that it brought attention to one of the questions that you asked us at the very beginning. And thankfully, throughout this process, we've been able to talk to you. But uh, the concern about wanting in the younger audience mm -hmm. and um, wanting to find an audience <clears throat> in that way. And we found the question rising. For every organization, it's really important to know who is your audience. It's the most important question to ask and throughout to continue to remind yourselves. Who are they? Where are they? What are their social circles? Their social ecosystem, so to speak. And for us, looking at the Dallas Stream News, it's pretty clear that you have a very specific audience that is really advocating or really uh, patronizing the organization. And it's generally an older audience, older and white, and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Often, that's an advantage, if you think about it. Who has more disposable income? Who might be more established in their lives? That can be advantageous. And so, thinking about who is our audience, reaching out to them. Chances are, those social circles are in various areas and overlap. So it's the personal connection that draws people to events. Think about events that you've gone to. Aren't we so much more often wanting to go to events that a friend has invited us to? Right? I think one of the the awesome things that you did in that concert was having the uh, two ticket, it was the $50 for two tickets for those on the email list. We thought that was actually a really incredible idea and something that you can work with and experiment with and exploit. And that further gives an incentive to those to go forth. Uh, a phrase that has come up throughout our process of working this is turning your audience into advocates. Those who will help you in this process. You can't do everything alone. So having your audience be your advocates and work with you and spread the word about the great concerts that you guys offer and the good educational outreach that you guys have. And so the section that I'll be talking about is expanded customer support base. Your support as in the audience, the customers are the audience, those who attend the events. And thankfully, you have an extensive email list. And in the concert, we'll be able to give you kind of a taste of a survey uh, but I think definitely utilizing the email list and that way where it's not as um, time sensitive. Making a quick online survey, which you'll find in the packet and I'll be emailing you later today. Um, a quick online survey that they can go through and you can begin to find information. One of the questions is actually asking if they're involved in any other social organizations or country clubs and finding their areas that they might have influence in and go towards those. So following the leads, pinpointing neighborhoods, places of interest that you may reach out to. And this is strategic. So the more that you can pinpoint areas and neighborhoods, especially around SMU, the better. Because then you can, you can save money when you send out mail advertisements. You can also uh, perhaps utilize their relationships with country clubs who often host events and music events to uh, show the educational outreach. Obviously, you can't have your acts that you bring in from across the world to come and do events. But using the students that participate in the masterclass, you can approach it from the angle of, if you were supporting us, you were supporting these young musicians. And just wait until you come to our actual concerts. It's just one idea. So go where your supporters are and encouraging them along the way 
to advocate for your organization and give them incentives to those who partner and expand your audience. And using geographic information systems, just very, very briefly, um, we're able to tell a whole lot of things about the area that we live in. This one is telling the predominant population. Right here is where you'll find uh, SMU and the whole central area. And what's not shown is the gray, it's actually predominantly white population, which confirms a lot of what we saw in the audience. And we would imagine if they're elderly, they would not want to travel very far. And so really focusing on the central area for advertising could be advantageous. Why are there so many orchestras in the area? Why doesn't, why doesn't everyone just go to Dallas Symphony? It's because they're focused on the local regions. And it's that pride of having an organization like that. That is a market that you can tap into. The next graph shows different areas of household income. And the bigger the dots, the more that they are attributing more financial income to their households. And you can see surrounding this area, obviously this one's a little lower because there's a lot of student housing and so there won't be as much. But you can see in certain neighborhoods around, and these can actually be much larger. They're just pinpointing the center of them, showing that these, many of them are at least six figures of their income, many are more than that, much more than that. Finding these neighborhoods, going for them can really, really help not just strong audience, but also give more financial sustainability. And so another way that you can expand your audience can be through social media and other uh, internet means, and I'll pass it off to Pedro Matt. So your online presence in this day and age is your reputation. That's the first place people will go to find out about your organization, whether it's a local business or a nonprofit. If your online presence isn't well situated and well created, then suddenly you kind of find a few spot in your marketing. The first thing I want to look at is your website. This is your first sort of stop whenever you are learning about your organization. And websites these days need to be you know, looked well together and display all important information about your organization. When events are occurring, where they're occurring, and price point. For the most part, the Dallas Chamber Music Society's website does these things. Except for a, uh, a few small minor things you can change really quickly to then boost up the way the website looks to uh, potential clients. The first thing is the way you guys utilize color. I think having information to trade up on your website in front of images is a great idea. The problem is when you start mixing colors on colors. Things like this blue font at the bottom here is kind of difficult to read depending on the size of your screen and the age of your eyes. Now I have bad eyes naturally and on my home computer this is hard for me to read. And the thing is if, if it's hard to read, no one's going to pick up the phone and call that number to purchase tickets. So normally when you have this kind of font or this kind of a message on your, on your website, you want to go with white is a great font color to use because it can project over almost any other color. This banner here rotates between numerous images. There's some with green, some with black, some with grays, and the blue gets lost in that. And we don't want that to happen. We want somebody to come to the website, see what you're offering, find that phone number, pick it up and dial. It has to, your website has to be designed or with something in mind for your client to do. So changing that could be one little thing. The other problem is that we run into missing HTML links or banner links, which gives off not the best impression to a viewer. Fixing this takes minutes out of somebody who developing a website's day. It's not a big deal. But saying how this kind of stuff, making sure that the website is running efficiently is going to help with your overall image. Um, lastly, this is your all's news page. So the first thing that a uh, client will see when they approach your website, funds front and center is your news section. Overall, it's giving you good information, a little, bio, a little bio about yourself, sort of explaining what the organization's about. But there's a few little weird little things I want to point out here that we can fix quite quickly. First thing is, these add comment sections need to go because there's no way for somebody to actually interact with them. If you click on them as a client, it doesn't bring you anywhere. And that kind of leads to confusion about where they should be going. You want them to go to your email list or your phone number. Having any sort of misleading pathway will bring them away from that final destination. The final thing is this huge amount of white space here on the side can be utilized much more efficiently. So that way they see 
more about what you want to offer. Anything that's, coming, anything that's important that's going to be coming up needs to come here. Now mind you, this changes depending on the size of your monitor and the resolution you're using. So a smaller resolution monitor, it looks fine. The problem is that technology these days, people are having larger and larger monitors. So they're seeing more and more white space. So learning how to efficiently utilize that white space to display what you want them to see is going to be important in your marketing. <clears throat> now, why is the website important? Because your social media will link back to that website. And when I first talked to you, I asked you about Instagram and Twitter, for example. Um, these are two major platforms for social media that people do utilize, but we don't think they're right for you for two reasons. One, it's the wrong target audience. Well, that's basically the reason. One, one reason that it's the wrong target audience. It tends to be a younger generation. Most people on these on the social media platforms are younger than big. And their income is much less than your normal patron income as it is, under 75,000. So if you spend resources and time targeting Instagram and Twitter, you're pulling valuable resources away from a platform that you can utilize really well, which I don't want to talk about. So the social media platform we would recommend is Facebook. <coughs> um, Facebook currently makes up 42% of monthly social media visits with 62% of seniors that are online age 65 and over on Facebook and 72% of people who are online between ages 50 and 64, which is exactly the audience we're going for. Additionally, over 70% of the people on Facebook make on average $75,000 or more a year. So they do, on average, have income to expend. Uh, currently on the Facebook page, you have 984 followers, which is a very large audience that we can draw from. The problem being right now is none of our, the upcoming concerts are posted. Um, it's only past events. And the late, it seems to be posting about once a month. The current latest post was at the beginning of November. Um, the way to keep uh, Facebook and utilize it, uh, use, utilize it effectively, sorry, would be to make sure that we're posting regularly and keeping those posts active in your uh, followers' news feeds. Then they can share them, would generate more interest. A uh, way to do that would be one way is through the free posts, but those don't tend to trend towards the top because Facebook filters out for paid advertisements. The good news is Facebook can be a very cheap and effective way to reach a large number of people very quickly. Currently, the minimum commitment to, uh, for paid advertisements on Facebook is just a dollar a day, which means for about $30 a month, we can reach over 1,200 people, um, depending on the, how long you want your ad to run, how many people you want it to reach, how much you want to commit to paying for it. Um, but say we do a $30 advertisement and you reach 1,200 people, but only 10 people buy tickets, that's still four to $500 in um, proceeds for a small commitment. You can promote post, uh, like individual events and you can run those for a specific amount of time. You can do posts, you can do the page overall, um, and you can advertise them as precise as you like. So you can do it by location. If you want the zip code right around SMU, uh, demographics, people who are over the age of 50, um, by keyword or likes, so example, you can do people who also like the Dallas Symphony, or even just with keywords, classical music, chamber music, etc. Um, so their insights also allow us to see uh, the number of people they had reaches, as well as the demographics of the people who interact with it. So say it tells you that we reached 1,200 people, it'll also say 57 uh, interacted with the ad. These are their demographics, so we can further target those ads later to fit a more specific audience. And we'll pass it off to you. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, so uh, we've been doing a lot of talking about reaching your audience. Um, and while that's important to reach out to new members, it's equally as important to know your current audience and understand them. So a customer relationship management program um, basically is able to keep you organized and uh, keep you running as effectively as possible. Um, you're able to have a database where you can have all of your client information, um, you know, for all your patrons, see their engagement with your organization. You're able to do ticket sales. You're able to incorporate marketing with um, emails, newsletters, your social media that we've already mentioned. Um, and you're able to also fundraise. So with these programs, you're able to track and analyze um, all the different information that you've gathered from your patrons. 
um, and really understand where, where they're coming from, their demographics, their income, their, um, again, engagement with your organization and, and their involvement. And so um, in the packet, I've analyzed four different programs, but more specifically, um, I would like you to look at Vendini. And we've actually already talked with you about this program. I've been, um, I've been in lengthy discussions with them. Yeah. <laughs> well, good. <laughs> um, uh, so I, after doing some research, I am recommending Vendini, and obviously you've been in touch with them, so you might have a little bit more information than I do. But um, from what I could see, they seem to be very user-friendly and have um, just their website right off the bat has a lot of information available to you without having to sign up for their services. Um, maybe that's not the case, but from the outside, that's what it looks to be. Um, <coughs> lots of good feedback from their current client base and um, seems to be able to really keep organizations running smoothly and, and you know, making a profit and able to really engage and connect with their audience. Um, so there are others that I've analyzed, you can see on the charts there. Um, really, I think it's gonna come down to you just biting the bullet, getting some sort of um, client or customer relationship management software um, just to, to go for it. And um, obviously you can try out different ones and see what's gonna work best for you, but I think Vendini would offer um, a really good starting point. Next, Nick. <laughs> okay, so um, I was in charge of outreach and engagement. Um, in the in the documents, um, those are mostly examples of things, and I'll talk about those in a second. Um, so outreach and engagement, there's there's a, a big difference that we've talked about in class. A lot of times when arts organizations talk about outreach, they're mostly talking about education sources like uh, the master classes and things that you guys already do. Um, but there is a, different, a distinction that we want to make between outreach and engagement. So outreach is reaching out to communities and people that lack access to your product, okay? Um, engagement is actually like including members of your community in different ways, business partnerships, government organizations, individuals. Um, and so why, why do we want to focus on outreach and engagement? Obviously it engages community. By engaging community, you're giving members of your community like a sense of place, a sense of ownership of your organization. People like that are gonna be more likely to volunteer, they're gonna be more likely to attend, they're gonna be more likely to patronize any kind of your events, they're also gonna be more likely to maybe donate in the future. So giving giving people a sense of community in that way is, is really beneficial, um, and engagement's a great way to do that. Um, also, it opens up a, uh, some more grants for us, right? Educational grants, things of that sort. Um, so an important part of um, outreach engagement is to identify the audiences that you that you want to work with. Um, so in different ways, um, engagement you can include, you can um, engage school age children. So that's going out to schools, hosting children's concerts, things like that. Um, promote lifelong passion appreciation for music. Um, children always have to bring their parents. They bring friends, stuff like that. They come with a little bit more. They come in more pack. Um, and you know you're developing. Um, you're developing more of a bond of the community. People love to see organizations that work with children. It's a really, you know, it's a really big positive. Um, then you have college students, or kind of that. I said college students, but really kind of that like college young professional range. Maybe people who are, especially for someone like Dallas Chamber Music, people that be interested are people that are working towards being in symphony music or working towards being in chamber music, stuff like that. They're closest to the professional careers. They're probably going to be your most engaged and educated audience. Um, and they could also, they could be the ones that are really looking for internship and volunteer opportunities. Not necessarily going to have a lot of ex external funds to work with, but um, their labor and power could be beneficial in that way. And then finally, adults. Um, obviously, this is more, um, this is a huge range, but these are going to be your most financially stable, most likely to attend, donate, patronize, things of that sort. Um, so it's important when thinking about engagement outreach, who are we going to, who are we trying to identify as our target audience? Um, so a couple ideas. 
So your current offerings right now, and correct me if I'm wrong, but we have pre-concert lectures and the master classes at SMU. Both are really positive. Um, the Chamber Music Society of Lincoln Center does actually like several different kinds of pre-concert lectures. Sometimes the composers come in, sometimes it's someone just talking about the pieces. But that's a really successful program that they have that's really good for the already existing patrons. Um, and then your master classes at SMU, um, I, I think that's a great opportunity to act um, to work with those college age students, but I think it can be expanded. So on top of that, um, so I talked about in this morning document the example of uh, local chamber music, that's the Fort Worth Chamber Music Society, that's in there, um, a direct competitor, and then two extremely successful organizations, it's the Treetop Music Chamber Society, which um, I'm blanking on where they're from, I think they're from the Northeast, and then there's the Music so the Chamber Society of Lincoln Center, which is obviously in New York City, very successful, and they do, they do things like this. Um, so master classes are a really great way of bringing in uh, people who are interested in this kind of music. Well, we can take the master class program that you guys are already offering, and we can still uh, the we can still maintain a really high level of artistry with our teachers, especially if we get musicians from the DSO involved or professors at SMU or UNT, really big time, but really um, locally well known and good musicians. Um, just in DFW the alone, there's 40 colleges. Oh, some of them don't have music programs, but there's some really big music programs in the area. Obviously, UNT, obviously SMU. You also have TCU. These are also these are all really um, really t uh, Texas A&M Commerce actually has a decent music program. These are all good way, all good places to reach out to. Um, so you know, thinking about costs, I know that expanding on you know that's always kind of the first thing. <laughs> that's a huge factor, and so. You know, you could bring in these awesome, the, the Lincoln Center, the, their master classes are run by, you know, all these really, really famous um, and excellent musicians. But I think what we can do is we can, like, to keep costs down, we can use professors and especially graduate students that are interested in doing this kind of work. Um, that, that would be a lot cheaper, but you're not really, you're not losing too much artistry from there. They still know a lot about the material, they're really well, especially graduate students and professors are already in to teach, like they're, a, I mean, I know I'm teaching, all the professors obviously teach. So that, that's a really, you know, you've already got someone who's used to working with students. Um, so they can go around to these schools, um, and graduate students are probably even going to do it for a lot less because they're looking to build resume, they're looking to build community service hours, they're looking to build all these different kinds of things. Um, and what you're doing more importantly is, rather than just, you know, you're, you're, building, you're building this community around education, and that's, that's a really good thing. Um, the, and master classes can have different things, themes. Um, there were different programs that talk about audition prep, interpreting different styles of music and composers, practice techniques, so it doesn't have to just be like, Oh, come up and play. You know, play your Bach, play your Handel. Like, let's do, like it can have different themes, and that and that um, will draw on different kinds of student musicians. And then, last thing, just a couple quick ideas. Um, other ideas that you could maybe expand on um, that wouldn't take away too much. Um, you could have composer talks if they're going to be maybe the local composers, or maybe their composers are already coming in to see stuff. They could have they could have talks, children's concerts. Um, those are a great way to get out into schools and stuff. And then teaching live schools through music, that's kind of, that goes along with children's concerts, that's kind of a topic for those. Um, you also asked about competitions in your email. Um, competitions are a great, a great way to target different kinds of uh, audiences, but like, you know, musician audiences, um, promoting the communities of musicians you wish to engage. Some competitions focus on the best and brightest of the younger generations. So I, I, I picked three very different, but three really high achieving um, competitions. First is the M Prize, which is a modern music chamber competition from the University of Michigan. The grand prize for that is $100,000, which actually now uh, their website says that they are not financially um, able to continue. <laughs> so maybe $100,000 is too big of a prize. <laughs> but, um, but it, it's a mod so the, the purpose for the Emprise is that's a modern chamber competition. That's a very specific audience they're going for. There's the Ara Araga, Ar Aragia, Ar Ar Ariaga, the Ariaga competition. Um, that's from the Treetop Music Chamber Society that I mentioned in there. Um, they're targeting 18 to 30 year old musicians. You're not allowed to be older than 8 to 35, and there's like a couple other um, age related things, but they're going for that one pre-professional, highly ed educated group. And then there's the Fischoff competition, which is young musicians from all around the world. Um, I know that the Dallas Chamber Music Society, one of the big focuses of your board is to keep everything at a really high artistic level. Um, you know, if, if, if they were able to put on a competition like that, I'm sure that they would be probably more interested in having like a really elite competition 
Um, and those are there are models out there to kind of work from. Um, I said it would be effective to fill a hole that's talking about like the enterprise is going away. So things like that, you could think about, okay, well maybe we could get into, I don't, I don't know about modern music. But you know, finding a different kind of competition, because there's already a lot of competitions and you want yours to kind of stand out above the rest. So to find something that, you know, maybe it's modern music, maybe it's um, locally composed music, maybe it's only music of this period, maybe it's musicians of a certain age. So different things to think about. Okay, so um, as Nick mentioned that there's so much things that we can explore and so we think that it might be more helpful if we can have some grant support. So this is the grant that we found this time to um, support the organizations and this grant are not only support the music organization, they're more focused on uh, music education and outreach. So we think this is more helpful. and. <clears throat> um, there at least uh, because some of them, uh, most of them, um, open the application more than two times a year. So we least the uh, more uh, the most close date on the packets in the packets, so that you can see in the packets. And um, and some of them are support not only the organization they found project like the. Um, National Endowment for the Art. They found projects so you can apply more than one project each time and you can have more applications every year. And uh, Tom will talk about more details that we choose from this organization. We choose three, or, uh, three organizations and he will tell you more details about why we choose this organization. The first organization, the Adario Foundation, they're really big on music education and outreach and building communities, and they seek to achieve high excellence. So I think you all fit that category especially. And a common theme that I'm going to share with you as well is that all these application due dates are well within reach as of right now. So I would highly encourage you to investigate these grants. The next one is the National Endowment for the Arts. They're an independent federal agency. Oh, excuse me. The Adario Foundation, it is a foundation, and it is uh, of natural, uh, national acclaim, and with the, uh, with the National Endowment for the Arts, that is federally funded. So that's something that you can go towards as another option. Um, the next one is the MTNA Foundation, and they approach this three-pillar plan, which I think fits you all perfectly, is that they love to engage the public, <coughs> sustain the profession, and, and to inspire their members. And so, um, with all of these top three grants, that I think they all reflect the DCMS in a, a wonderful way. And I think even with these three uh, top three grants that we're choosing for you to go after, all of them are within reach for you to apply as of right now. And so, uh, with that, I think we have a little bit of time for Q and A. Thank you, everyone. This is great. Happy to answer any questions if you want. Mm -hmm. And I can send that information to you. 
that would be grants, but that's fallen, it has fallen a little bit by the wayside recently, so it's on my task list to start getting into. So are any of the grants familiar from the list that you've been given here? The Meadows Foundation and Community Foundation. I I don't know, I will have to review our records and see if we have anything from the from the National Endowment for the Arts. Um, but yes, the yeah, the Meadows Foundation, I'm sure, and the Community Foundation of, of Texas. There's a couple other foundations here in Texas. We've also had grants from before TACA. Mm -hmm. um, that one were kind of, I don't think we're really eligible for TACA anymore because TACA is changing their structure of how they do grants. Mm -hmm. um, we just had a small, super small grant that we did, we did win, super small. But everything mm -hmm. counts, so. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll take it. Something in the MTNA Foundation, they have grants up to $5,000 in their project base. And so um, we as a group found that it was super important that for it to start outreach, you know, starting small, you know, and implementing things. But uh, with that project, you do a project towards the community enrichment and education in that way. So that'd be a good way to start. They also have um, individual, individual grants, and not a lot of grant foundations are able to do that. They wanted to do it just project based. Mm -hmm. And I think the individual grant base was 750. Okay. So. Yeah, we looked at a grant through uh, Chamber Music America, actually. Because um, mm -hmm. we have a residency coming up uh, in the 1920 season. And the, the stuff was that. And so they. This, it had the, the spectral, their manager had to ask, could only ask one organization to apply for that grant. Um, so it has to come from a group that's going to be performing. Interesting to ask the question that was to apply. So, and man alive, the deadline didn't have enough time for the deadline. But I know sometimes some of these grants also the application process and the, the requirements to fulfill what the grant is for is pretty pretty intensive. And so that was the other thing. We didn't have enough time, but also just the logistics of organizing what was needed for it was was a little bit over the top for what for where we were at. So so it'll be interesting to see what the community constraints have to offer as far as those expectations. I think one thing to realize is that I know we're suggesting does cost money for expansion, for sure. Um, but what we hope to really submit, you know, put in concrete here is that you have a strong foundation support already yes. with people who are well off, who support your organization, who are local. And if you market directly towards them, you can definitely, definitely bring in more people who are willing to buy concert tickets, to donate, to help support the organization. Um, mm -hmm. and, I, and I just think that. Focusing on that one group is going to be what's going to help boost up the group's income. Yes, agreed. And then that'll hopefully give you the revenue you need to start looking towards, you know, expanding education, expanding outreach, things like that. And that way, when you actually do apply for these kind of grants, you have a solid history about what you guys have been doing. Right. Right. So it's going to be one of those things that takes time. Yes. And, um, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen overnight. Yeah. <laughs> but I really think that if you, uh, with this kind of thought in mind, you can definitely start pushing your organization towards that kind of future. Yeah. yeah. And especially keep your ties with previous grant foundations that you've done within the past. Because I know that you had history with, with Top of Course, and we'll talk about that. And <coughs> definitely Texas Instruments. Um, they're really, really big on the education front. And the, um, I think the Meadows, and I was going to ask you this, but I don't know if the Meadows Foundation is exactly tied to SMU because I know that you've had uh, in the past grant uh, history with SMU. So I, I think the Meadows is somewhat the same, but I'm not entirely sure. But I think with the, especially with the Brown Foundation, the Community Foundation of Texas, and that one, those local drives, as Pedro was saying, is going to really help. Mary, another uh, consideration I, I kind of thought I thought of this morning after we had already published the uh, council. So, um, another like engagement opportunity that may not necessarily cost any money, 
Um, but it's like inner collaboration between like different kinds of arts organizations. Mm -hmm. Like just inviting like if, if you're at the Meadows, um, it's a Meadows concert hall, is that what it's called? Or it's school music. Yeah, school yeah, music. Meadows school music. Yeah. Um, in that concert hall area, that really nice kind of lobby, um, you could have like an art gallery come in and bring in pieces that for people to do an auction. You could have, um, you know, you could have, I mean, you can get creative, like you can somehow involve a dance troupe, or you can involve like, but things that are also really keeping in, in, in mission with uh, DCUS being like a really high quality, making sure everything's like really, really top notch stuff. You could bring in those things, like have a silent auction, have, you know, um, different kinds of, and that, like, it wouldn't cost, I don't, I don't think, I don't think it would cost you to have that kind of thing going on. So just finding things like that that don't cost any extra money, but can, you know, draw different people in, draw different people from different areas that may not necessarily um, already attend. Mm -hmm. right. That's really well, good. Following up with that, something that we noticed that we been thinking about <clears throat> holding down audience to more older and um, <coughs> more established uh, is that, <clears throat> like, thinking about the concert, it seems it's more of a what we would consider like a higher end experience. Yeah. And that's something that we really think that like, why would someone buy like designer clothing and accessories? Mm -hmm. It's like, that's the crowd that might splurge and get that you know, like really expensive <laughs> Tiffany necklace or something. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same way that they think, oh, well, you know, we're not only are we gonna see this great international act, but also there's going to be these artists that are there. Just any way that you can help give them that feeling uh, that this is a like, high end experience. Right. They they love it's kind of an ego boost in a way, yes. which is what I was getting at with um, if you're able to tap into utilizing those participating in master classes in a way. Another part of that tapping into the ego is they love supporting mm -hmm. the other students and being like, oh, I'm really doing something. I'm giving back to these kids. Mm -hmm. Right. And so any way that you can kind of which hit that in path. in like in our end of year thank you letter which I was working on um, and we had to swap it from um, a donor letter to a thank you letter because our gala is going to be in September of next year so we're going to have another ask coming out um, but I mean that's already that's incorporated into that focus um, so so the logistics of getting some of this done is um, it takes time yeah. so like it isn't an overnight project it, it's going to take months so <coughs> some of those things there are there's a lot that you can go on the table for my part we do a competition that's come up we really like to see that go places i really like to help give that feet um we used to have i would like to see more outreach going on with booker t we used to have more going on with them than we do um so but it's just one of those things, given given where I came on with them and when I came on and given where we're at, with where we were at with the season needing to get off the ground, um, that's why it's like having to tackle one project at a time and have a whole bunch of stuff on the horizon and go, okay, this is where I want to get, but we're not there yet. <laughs> so, um, but case in point, I'm already, I'm already working on stuff for, for our 2019 deal in September, and that's what, 10 months out. So, and I'm still working on stuff for all the concerts this season. So, they're great ideas. Um, so, yeah, yeah. We hope that it's, this has been not only but encouraging. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, it's, because really, it's the, not just like the foundation is there, but the actual structure of the building is there and yeah. mm -hmm. things are happening. And, mm -hmm. um, so, it's really mm -hmm. important you to leave and feel like encouraged. And these are just ideas that. We're not saying you have to take every single one, obviously. <laughs> um, but just ways that maybe it will spark an entirely different thought we didn't talk about today. So. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. One thing that I think would be easy to set up and people would appreciate is sort of like a get to know you artist pamphlet or something on the yes. website. Because you have the bios about the organization, like the ensembles who come on the website, but they don't actually know the players themselves. Mm -hmm. And if you could, when you're talking with the artist is then like a little questionnaire like, what's your favorite kind of food? What's your favorite kind of music? Yeah. Things like that. And so people are not only invested in the organization, but also these musicians. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly it's not just about this awesome ensemble, but you know who's going to come to play. You know what they like. And it's sort of another level of interaction and engagement that is not often seen in classical music because people get up on stage, they play, and that's it. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
you don't get to know who they are actually are as people. And that could be something as you set up a Word document, you send it out, they send it back to you, great, you put it on the website, and that's it. And then suddenly people are learning about the ensemble, learning what they, about the people within them, and that's another way to get people inter interested in investing. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah, going along that vein, from what I observed from the, uh, the string quartet, that they're all, they've all been playing together for like 15 plus years. And that's why they're so darn good. And I think people want to know that because they basically grew up together, playing together. Mm -hmm. You know, those are just little things that people are like, wow, that's amazing. Maybe my granddaughter could do that. Or maybe, you know, something like that. Any other comments or thoughts? I, they all really had a wonderful experience attending the concert. First of all, they were very impressed with the quality of the musicians and the, the <coughs> level of excellence that was achieved in the overall performance. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, the sense of community that they observed and the just the social strength and the, and the bond that your audience members share is very powerful. <laughs> They were really impressed. And I hear that Tom's got a chance to attend the after concert. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So that was oh. very fun. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this is hopefully going to be an opportunity to help, you know, all the things you're doing. And um, I know our, our students really learned a lot getting to know more your organization.